Art is open to interpretation, but here's something that's totally clear. You can save on your bus trip to the First Street Transit Gallery to see works from CSULB students. Get your Go Beach Pass from Long Beach Transit for as little as $40 a month for unlimited bus rides, then go check out pieces from your fellow students on display in downtown Long Beach. Great value and great art, it's as easy to understand as that. For more information on the Go Beach Pass from Long Beach Transit, visit ridelbt.com forward slash students. I found like through volunteering that age doesn't really matter. It's what you do to the community. And it really has helped me just like um, what you do every day is what matters at the end. What's going on, good people? Welcome back to Beach Weekly, a podcast created and produced by Long Beach State student-run newspaper, The Daily 49er. My name is Jeremy Taylor, the podcast editor here at The Daily 49er. And joining us, as always, is the multi-talented Cindy Aguilera. Cindy, good afternoon. What's going on, guys? Good to be here. Happy to be here. Let's get the show started. Cindy, tell me what your week's been going like. How's school going for you? You know, school is going. I'm pretty sure we all can relate. It is going. It is going forward. Um, We're approaching that uh, midterm mark, and I can't believe it. We're halfway done. Can you believe that, JT? Yes. uh, You know, in all honesty, we're halfway done, but I'll be glad when we're completely done because it's been a long, Uh rough year. I think (gasps) the transition going back to campus is a little bit harder than I anticipated. You know, I don't know about you, but it's just like, it's just a grind trying to get up and drive to school, find parking, walk to class, go to class, walk back to your car, drive home. And those precious hours, you know, they add up and they definitely, you know, I wish there was more time in the day, but you know, you got to sally forth and keep it pushing. Yep, I agree. So Cindy, what's been going on? Do you have any Halloween plans coming up? Halloween's right around the corner. I know. I'm so excited. So I have, um, I know I'm late to this because this movie came out, if I'm not mistaken, last week, but Halloween, the movie, a new one is coming out. And I think this seems like to be a wrap up of the whole, like, you know, Halloween movie series. If you haven't seen them, go watch them now because they're iconic. How can you not know what Halloween is? Mike Myers. Is it Mike or Michael? It's Michael Myers. Yeah. I always Uh, get those confused, but you know what I mean? Mike. Yeah, Mikey. <laughs> Myers. Mikey Myers is at it again. Yeah, good old Mikey is at it again for sure. So, uh, yeah, looking forward to these Halloween movies. I'm so excited. Okay. Uh, any plans on trick or treating? You're going to go out and do a little bit of a, what do you call it? Like uh, Universal Studios, Halloween Horror Nights, not I scary film. I don't know if that's my thing anymore. I mean, what, like just going out and showing off my costume? I guess maybe we'll see. I know that Hollywood is a popular Halloween night destination for that for that reason, to go and show off your costume. Um, but no, I don't have any plans. What about you, JT? You know, my oldest is 17, so he's not trying to go trick-or-treating at all. <laughs> right. Um, and my youngest, she's going trick-or-treating. So I might go with her or I might Ooh. just sit at the house and do a little bit of handing out some candy and, you nice. know, wear a little funny mask. This is the one time where wearing a mask is definitely you know, welcomed and there's no controversy. Yes, for sure. So having said that, still wear your mask, you know, and when appropriate, please people. Yeah, absolutely. And I actually want to shout one little tradition out um, that I have been wanting to talk about is Dia de los Muertos and that's Day of the Dead. Um, In Latin America, we celebrate that November 1st. And, um, you know, it's just like a way to honor people that have passed on, you know, our ancestors. And it, it is kind of spooky, but it's not like, you know, it's not supposed to be scary. It's just, you know, technically you are talking to the, what is it, the afterlife or, you know, ghosts. Um, and you, so you build up these altars in your home, usually, and um, you place pictures of your loved ones, you place, you know, their favorite foods, things that remind you of them and again like you just honor the people that have passed on um and in a way you keep their memory alive um so that's coming up I'm really excited for that the movie Coco is kind of about Dia Dia, how you say it again yeah Dia de los Muertos okay I'm not gonna even attempt that but (laughs) so the movie Coco is about that and I've seen the movie Coco and my daughter's uh 
ninth birthday is coming up. So she wants to tie her ninth birthday in with that holiday. And Ooh. so she's doing like a cocoa party. She has like a cocoa uh, pinata and everything. And oh my God, that sounds like so much fun. Yeah, so we're all going to wear costumes. She told me just to wear a silly mustache and that's about it. <laughs> <laughs> I think that sounds like a lot of fun. I totally support the festivities and it's it's a, it's a really meaningful holiday for Latin American culture. Like in El Salvador, where my family's from, we legitimately will go to where your ancestor is resting and just spend time with them. You know, you like have sort of like a picnic almost, uh, you like clean up, you know, their, their grave and everything, but the whole point is to spend time with them. So uh, the, the whole holiday has a lot of significance for me. And I think anyone that participates more power to you. Do you do the whole, like, what is it called? The ofrenda, like the, the altar, do you guys do that as well? Yeah. So we have a few because of COVID and everything, you know, there's definitely been like a lot more losses um, in the last year or so. So a lot of people have experienced a lot of losses, not me personally, but it is something to keep in mind. So like in the last few years, we've, you know, unfortunately have, have gained what we call like ancestors. So we're going to be putting a few more people up on the altar um, and honoring them this holiday. Have you seen the movie Coco? Oh, of course. Yeah. Oh my God. We went to watch it with my mom. It was a whole thing. It's like a family favorite. No, I think it's beautiful, you know, especially mm -hmm. because when we lose our loved ones so often, you know, uh, everybody mourns differently, but a lot of times they do get forgotten about. And just because they're not here, we should still remember them. I know right. that I often go and pay respects to my grand grandmother's grave all the time, there you even go. though she's not here. So I definitely feel you on that, on, on uh, paying respects to our fallen loved ones for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right, Cindy. Well, let's get to the reason why everybody is here. Let's hit everybody with this hot news. All right. Um, so as you guys maybe, I don't know if you know, but I hope you know, the Daily 49er has an October issue. And this issue specifically focuses on LGBTQ plus voices. And it is a myriad of stories, a collection of just like everything from sports, lifestyle. I mean, our staff just went ham and really did an amazing coverage of LGBTQ at CSUOB. Um, one of the stories that really kind of like stuck out to me just because the title was just like, oh snap, um, is the story titled, Your Allyship Won't Make You a Hero. And this is by uh, our writer, Rain O. And um, I, I, allyship and like the whole performative allyship of, you know, the topic of it is, is really interesting because basically what it is, is kind of, performing online like you're really down for the cause for a lack of just a better phrase um and in real life you know and in the real world not really doing a whole lot about it um and the article here the author just goes on and explains just um basically that social media activism does little to actually affect change the act of posting content on social media is in itself performative and largely determined by algorithmic success so you know like when you go on instagram right like the likelihood you're going to see what everyone else sees is not it's not likely you're going to see your friends your homies more than anything so right. Activism online is not really activism. This this article really was interesting to me because in a way I agree, if you're not really putting in the work into the real world, what does it matter? You know, remember they had that whole thing when the Black Lives Matter movement started and they were putting a black square on your right. social media, like on your there Instagram you page. So a lot of people were doing that just for clout. If you're not down for the cause and you're just faking for clout, don't bother. Yeah, boom. Mic drop. I mean, honestly, though, because, you know, uh, like author Rain goes on to say, it's just an attempt to remedy something. It's just like a band aid, really. You know, if you're not really pushing forward and actually using that movement to do something, then yeah, you're just being fake and you're just doing it for clout. You know, it's not a trend. Like the ice bucket challenge was a trend. This is not yeah. a trend. Yeah, yeah definitely. exactly. And well, when you deal with people's lives, you can't be over here, you know, half stepping and faking. You definitely, yeah. you know, because this stuff is serious to a lot of people. Whether yeah. It's Black Lives Matter, whether it's the LGBTQ allyship, there's a lot of great causes. Even the Asian American uh, cause that was going around earlier after the Asian violence, 
yeah. you know, there's a lot of great causes out there and I'll, that could use our help and we just got to help out. But if you're not willing to do it, I mean, I don't understand why people would do it for clout, but then again, why, do, why do we do things for clout period? So it looks good on paper. Yeah. Cause so that people see that you care, but it's like, I mean, that's not the point. People aren't supposed to see that you care. It's just you doing it, man. Just got to do it. But isn't that kind of like the antithesis of like social media? I mean, everything people yeah. put on social media, like, have you seen those videos where people will go and they go, oh, well, hey, I'm giving this homeless person some food and have somebody film it. Yeah. You know, true generosity and caring is not showing people, you know, and showing of the world what you're doing. It's just doing it and not getting that clout and getting that love from these fake ones or whatever. Yeah. It's about just doing it out of the goodness out of your own heart. So, yeah. You know, a lot of people I feel like think like, did if did it happen unless it social media saw it? You know, like did it really happen if Instagram didn't see it? You know what I mean? Like you need to post it for it to be real. And so I think like in a really weird way, people feel like they need to post every little activist thing that they do. But you know, the the real activists they're not out here. You know, posting every little move they make. Have you done any activism? You know, I, you know, inadvertently have always just been very upset at the norm, <laughs> not intentionally. Uh, but since high school, yeah, I've pretty much read literature, you know, Maya Angelou and all these like super powerful women that um, from a very young age taught me that the way that things are, are not the way that things should or have to be. Um, when I got old enough, I always chose, you know, courses and and environments that fulfilled that um, identity, you know, that I have to kind of roll with on a, on a daily basis. Um, but yeah, protests, I mean, you know, even crowdsourcing, you know, foundations, donating, whatever it takes, you know, to, to help someone pursue the movement or help someone just do, it, you know, just pursue the the movement in itself, you know, and it can be anything. It could be helping someone buy school supplies or donating to an organization or going to a protest. What else you got for me? All right. Um, so let's talk about some of these LGBTQ stories and content, because I'm just loving what Daily 49er did. We went all out. Uh, Multimedia has a very beautiful video. Um, of course done by our team and this is called October at the Daily 49er and it features three staff members and it's a cute just you know little short clip on YouTube and it summarizes just what it's like to be queer and be a student and be in journalism and I think it's so awesome and very insightful and very creative and of course always done very beautiful by our multimedia team. This particular video was shot by um, our very amazing Rain O and uh, looks great. Yeah, Rain's been putting in a lot of work, whether yeah, it be writing Killing stories it. or just doing the multimedia stuff. So do us a favor, please check out that content. It's great mm -hmm. stuff and support our people over here at the Daily 49er. What else oh, you got yeah. for me? And well, you know, I told you I wrote this story about my friend Johnny Sweets. Um, that I just want to shout out again, part of it's part of the October issue. It got such good reception from so many people. Um, so shout outs to our editors who helped me publish that story and get it out. I'm really happy about that. And also the Long Beach Marathon. Anybody who ran the Long Beach Marathon this past weekend, shout outs to you. It was 26 miles. And my friend, that is not easy. Um, I have a friend, uh, shout outs to Bianca Garcia. She ran the whole 26 miles. I think she busted her ankle at some point and she just kept on running. Um, I mean, that's my definition of a survivor, right? Um, but yeah, you know, Long Beach Marathon looked like it was really, really cool. Um, Daily 49er wrote a very insightful um, article. And that was a really interesting quote there. Um, Ulysses, our reporter there, interviewed someone um, and, you know, he's talking about how he was an older gentleman kind of running and he's like, it's like in his 70s, you know, he's getting up there, right, and in the older stages of his life and he's out here running and stuff. And he talks about just how his biggest motivation for running this marathon at his age was 
I'll quote it is he says, for me and for the rest of my companions, what is more important is health. And he says, you know, your body can atrophy if you, you know, stop walking. And, you know, I, he says, I want to be like some of these people who are 82 and they're still running out here. And I think that's such a cool, like, um, you know, perspective to have, especially for something so challenging, like a marathon. Could you imagine running 26 miles? And I'm not running to my driveway right now. Are you kidding me? <laughs> no, I heard when people run those marathons, like they have to put like stuff on parts of their bodies to keep from chafing, like the yeah. toenails fall off. It's a real, like, I would imagine just like the mental fortitude that it takes just to get through that because your body has to start breaking down at some point. So to be able to push through and be able to finish, like you said, your friend busted her ankle and she finished. That's that's really incredible. So props to her. Um, going back to your story that you wrote with Johnny Sweets. So yeah. let's talk about the aftermath of that story. How did he feel about when it came out? So, um, you know, he's in the in the article that I wrote, we're talking about him coming out when he was 16, which, by the way, he came out twice. Like the second time was to like reiterate because his parents just were like, oh, it's a phase. He'll get over it. He had to come out a second time to like reiterate, like, no, I'm gay. Like, I'm always be gay. Like, this is just who I am. And um, it, it was just such an interesting um, conversation because his parents, you know, I guess as a parent, I don't have kids, but, you know, JT, like you, you have expectations for your kid, you know, like you want them to grow up a certain way. And I think that's what they thought about Johnny. They wanted him to grow up a certain way. And he just was going to do his own thing and he's going to do his own thing. So um, now they're a really supportive family. They love him. He says that, you know, when he visits Mexico, which is his family's from a really, really small town. Um, his family is very accepting, very welcoming and not at all like hostile or homophobic. So it's going really well, thankfully. Excellent. Excellent. What else you got for me? Um, let's see. Well, you know, we have, like I said, uh, a lot of October stories. Um, I did want to talk about this immersive art exhibit. I actually wrote that down because that sounded really, really cool. Oh, talk, hey. Talk to me about it. Talk to me about the immersive art exhibit. Let's go. Yeah. So actually you have some notes on that, but I forgot before. I know I, I messed up. I forgot to talk about Elaine. Um, should we just talk about Elaine? Yeah, let's Lane. talk about Elaine first, and then I'll talk about the immersive art exhibit. Yeah, you, obviously, you, you have some thoughts on this. We'll talk about it there. You, sure. talk, you tackle that. Um, yeah, so I talked with Elaine and Anareta, and she is the recent recipient of the CSU. What, help me out here. CSU Board of Trustees, right? Yes. Um, she is only like 19. She's so young. And I mean, such a bright, bright person. She started volunteering when she was in school back in the Philippines. She went to a Catholic all girls school. And one of the biggest missions that they teach them there is to go out into the world, right? And like, just serve. And she says that she started volunteering from a really early age, helping out mental health People, just people that needed like mental health assistance. And um, she saw from a really early age, just like the impact of mental health. And as you can imagine, like many, many countries in the world, there are like very little to no mental health advocates. Um, mental health is not even a concept, you know? Um, and it's just, just starting to come around. Um, so she tells, I, I, I was able to talk with her on, uh, the, a few days ago, and we just talked about how volunteering really put her in a position to like, not only be able to come to the US and study nursing, but to get a more sympathetic and like empathetic look at mental health. Um, she also shared some really good advice about how to stay above water as a student, you know, during really, really tough semesters. Well, I know that is going to be a great interview that you conducted. and I'm looking forward to listening to it. I was thinking about when we were going to produce this story and you like you were talking about mental health and for her to be like 19 years old and already aware of like mental health, because like the whole acknowledging of the mental health issues wasn't really a thing, say 20 years ago, maybe even like 10 years ago. They kind of just told you like, hey, suck it up, buttercup. 
you know, you kind of just have to compartmentalize and keep going. So for her to be so aware and to receive this award at such a young age is an incredible feat. Also, she's going to be coming in every checking in with us every once in a while and offering some mental health tips to help us get through midterms and finals. Correct. Yeah, so I'm really excited to introduce this new segment. She said that she would absolutely be available for future recordings. And I'm so, so excited to have her here. Um, Because yeah, who better than to give us mental health advice than a mental health advocate who's dedicated such her young life to, to, you know, making mental health a priority. And, you know, I want to give you just a little, a little tidbit, but, you know, so I said, I asked her, so if I'm feeling down, should I go volunteer, you know? And she was like, no, take care of yourself first, then go volunteer. I was like, yes, that is the kind of energy I need to hear, but it's true. You can't give from an empty cup. Um, but again, just that insightfulness, you know, she's, she's very wise. Oh, you can't give from an empty, an empty cup. That's a, Mm -hmm. that's a good one, right? I have to go on and remember that one. That's a good line. (laughs) There you go. What else you got for me? Um, well, you know, again, yeah, we're, we're looking forward to having, uh, that segment for mental health. And like you mentioned, we're going to have some mental health for, uh, you know, midterms, finals, um, and any other advice that maybe any listeners want to, want to hear or any questions. I think that's, that would be something good, right? JT to take some suggestions on maybe what students are struggling regarding mental health and absolutely, absolutely. Let's be honest, the hardest thing that we have to do, that most people can do is ask for help. Yes. So for her to be able to offer free advice like that to help somebody else, and then maybe just one person, and if that one person can get through whatever they're going through with just her with her message, that's a good thing. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Now back to that Long Beach Museum of Art. They extended their immersive exhibit until the end of October. Due to the popularity, the art exhibit by Tristan Eaton you know, it's a 25 year respective about it's all at once. And the museum is two floors packed with Eaton's work on display as a range of pieces as old as his high school sketchbook and his newest piece, a life-size self-portrait sculpture called Vice Lord, portraying his different vices. Rooms are filled with juxtapositions of large dunny and money toys to paintings and sketches to satirical creations and social issues. The American artist primarily known for his toy designs and street art murals, Eaton is also a graphic designer and illustrator. Eaton often visits the LBMA on Sundays, so guests can meet up with him and hear him talk about his pieces. He notifies fans via Instagram prior to his visits. So I was checking out some of his uh, artwork, and he's got a really, really dope Malcolm X piece. I can't draw a straight line, and (laughs) I always marvel at others' arts and their ability to create art. And this dude is super, super talented. So do whatever you can do. If you're down on a Sunday, go and check it out. And it's only here till Halloween, but it's definitely, definitely worth a view. And I think I'm gonna have to go down there myself. And they are open uh, Thursday through Sunday for those who are interested. That sounds like a lot of fun, JT. And listen, so you mentioned that he's, I think, extending it, if I'm not mistaken, to past Halloween. He's got this like Frankenstein and Bride of Frankenstein art piece that looks like crazy cool. Oh my God, it's got like all these colors and these cool graphics. I'm getting like a really like graffiti kind of mural vibe from him. Like I feel like that, I think that's what drew me. That's what like called me to to his art because it just is so bright and and powerful like a mural you know like these huge murals that you see in LA yeah exactly you know and he does have a bit of a graffiti street art uh, background again the museum is open Thursday to Sunday from 11 to 5 p.m entrance for the museum is $10 for students and seniors it's $12 for general admission and free for LBMA members and children under 12. I love that I love me an affortable museum or art gallery When's that. the last time you went to a museum or art gallery? You know what? I've been talking about going. I haven't gone in, I want to say definitely a year or more. Because I mean, of COVID, you know, everything was closed. And, and But museums and going to see art has been on my list for, for a few months now. Definitely check it out. And if you do, feel free to post on social media and let us know what you thought of it. We'll be glad to check that out. It's been a big night the last couple of nights for our uh, lady sports teams. First and foremost, Long Beach State junior Kashana Williams records her thousandth kill in a victory 
over UC San Diego Friday night. So Williams scored her six 20 plus kill match for the season, becoming the 17th player in Long Beach State history to record that 1000 kill milestone. The Beach will be taking on UC Irvine in a black and blue rivalry tonight at 5 p.m. in Irvine, California. The game will be broadcast live on ESPN+. Plus. So good luck to our ladies as they go on and continue to try to make their way to the playoffs. And last but not least for our sports is uh, Solano makes history as Long Beach State defeats UC Davis on the road Thursday. The Beach took down the Aggies of UC San Diego. Oh, I'm sorry, UC Davis. 1-0 to zero to move on to 4-1-1 one and one in conference play. Junior Lena Solano notched the lone goal on, of the afternoon, making her just the ninth player in Long Beach State single season history to score 10 goals in one year. Also, Lena was featured on ESPN Top 10 Sports Center plays a couple weeks ago, so she is really doing big things. The beach is now 7-5-2, and two. so after a rough preseason start, where they took some lumps, the ladies seemed to right the ship. They look to take on Bakersfield Roadrunners today. So good luck to our ladies as they go on and continue to make their way through the season. Cindy, is that all you have for us with the news? I think that's it. You know, shout out to our sports. They're always just kicking butt left and right. I don't think I have anything else. Really excited to see this Halloween movie for sure. What about Are you, you skittish? Think? Are you skittish in like horror movies to get scared? It depends. I have, okay, I will not watch like The Conjuring, you know, all that ghost stuff, the things I can't see, those things are the are what terror, terrorizes me, you know, the ghosts, the paranormal, that I cannot do. But when it's like a slasher movie, you know, like Mikey Myers, oh, Mikey, you know, just <laughs> all you got to do is run, you know, it's just one guy. You know what I mean? It just you have to just avoid death at all costs. But you know, it's it's more realistic to escape death. I think is what I think than a ghost. A ghost, you know, it, I'm asleep and he's watching me. Mm-mm, don't sit it right. Don't sit it right with me. Funny about those horror movies. Michael Myers will get his nice little stroll on. He won't <laughs> run. He won't do anything. Dude just strolls along and he always catches up with folks. Same thing with like Jason or any other serial killer. I'm with you on those uh, ghost story movies like The Conjuring and Annabelle and stuff like that. Some of those, Mm -hmm. you know, they will get the hairs to stand up on the back of my neck or whatever. But for me, I enjoy like classic monster movies like, you know, the old school latex monsters, you know, like, you know, vampire movies where the vampires didn't uh, glitter in the sun, you know. (laughs) Fall in and, love. Yeah, no, no, there's no. They, hey, they fall in love like in Dracula. But they're, yeah, they're, not not in a in a teenager kind of way. No, they're killing fools. <laughs> yeah, okay, let's let's just call it what it is. All right, <laughs> uh, werewolf movies. You know that they don't turn into big dogs, but they turn into man beast, and you know they wreak yeah, havoc yeah. on the town. Uh, zombie movies used to be kind of my thing, but now it's like zombies aren't even scary anymore, thanks to The Walking Dead. So definitely the old classic, you know, Universal. A matter of fact, there is a movie that's coming out now that I think about it. It's called Antlers. It's by Guillermo del Toro. It comes out October 29th. And I believe from what I can tell from the trailers and everything, it's kind of like about the Wendigo. Are you familiar with the Wendigo? No, what is that? Okay, so the Wendigo is like, correct me if I'm wrong, and please don't, you know, kill me in the comments. It's like a Native American uh, legend of a warrior or a person who eats human flesh in the forest or you know in the in nature or whatever and he takes on uh it becomes this you know the spirit of the wendigo and like you grow like these antlers and you know you superhuman strength and you know you live forever but you have a craving for human flesh so Mm -hmm. i've seen a little bit of the trailer and they were supposed to come out last year but obviously due to covid it didn't come out the trailer's out there if you want to see antlers go out and look it's if you're into good old-fashioned monster makeup you know, Guillermo del Toro never disappoints with his movies, and I'm definitely looking forward to it. So if you go to the movies, who knows, I might be sitting next to you. We'll high five each other or we'll both scream out loud. <laughs> I I absolutely agree. Guillermo del Toro never disappoints. And that sounds good. Antlers. OK. Well, folks, that is all we have for this week. Head on over to Daily49er.com where you can read more campus and Long Beach related news, as well as multimedia content like this podcast. You can also follow us on Instagram and Twitter at Daily49er. I've been your podcast editor, along with Cindy Aguilera. Thank you for tuning in. Have a tremendous week. Bye-bye, y'all. 
Southland is bringing its credit union experience to the Long Beach State campus. As a student of Long Beach State, you are eligible to join with access to our new university student union branch, student loan services, free checking, and free financial educational resources. Visit Beach CU for more information. Hello. Hello. Hi, good morning. I'm so sorry for being a little late. I was having oh, no, you're fine. trouble with my Wi-Fi. How are you this morning? <laughs> okay, well, it's getting cold, so I'm a bit cold. It's okay, though. <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, well, thank you for being here today. Um, it's a great honor to meet you. Um, you're like incognito on the web. Like we try to find your email and like there's no track of you. So I'm so glad that we were able to meet um, because we read uh, the article that was written about you. You are the recipient of um, the CSU Trustees Award and that's awesome. Congratulations. It's such a great Thank honor. Um, so before we start, um, like I mentioned, I really wanted to ask you mostly about like mental health and our focus for this particular episode is um, just like tips that uh, a professional like yourself can pass down to students um, who are you know going through it this semester especially with like you know transitioning back to campus some people are still virtual all of that um first things first is it okay if i record our meeting yeah go ahead just asking just making sure Okay, cool. So um, tell me, Miss Elaine. Um, so oh, you can just call me Elaine. Okay. <laughs> yeah. All right, I'll keep it simple, Elaine. Um, so as a mental health advocate, right? Um, how is the is your your career so far at Long Beach? How has that helped and shaped um, your outlook towards mental health? Um. So first thing, I don't really consider myself as a professional for mental health because I haven't graduated. So I don't really have any um, certifications backing up everything I'm saying because technically um, I'm still not yet there. Okay. I would like to talk about mental health as a, just a person who really just believes in it as okay. of the moment. Sounds good. Yeah, yeah that's fine. I'm not like a professional for mental health yet. Just yet, just yet. Okay, yeah, but you will be um, soon. So right now I'm pursuing a bachelor of science in nursing and I have a minor in psychology. Mm -hmm. In the future, I want to be an advocate for a mental health once I get a doctor in nursing with a specialty in psych, so I could be a nurse practitioner in psychology. And that's when I really want to be a mental health. That's I believe like a really big misconception because when I was younger. I believe that I can help people with mental health, even though I don't have like the uh, certifications for it. Right. Or any um, certificates. I have a QPR certification, mm -hmm. but it's not really um, a lot. Yeah. Have you always wanted to help people um, with mental health? Because um, you're really young, right? Like, I am. <laughs> and it seems like it's it's sort of been like something that's been in your life a long time because you started with this, if I'm not mistaken, when you were like 16, like you you were enrolled at Long Beach, that's really young. And again, so admirable and inspirational. Um, I have a niece that's 16 years old. And so, you know, it's really great to see like young people committing to something so 100% and doing so good. Um, so you've been doing this for a while, um, I would say, you know, a few years at least. What was it in in maybe your your childhood or or back home in the Philippines? Was there something that happened that woke you up to mental health or that made you um, aware? I mean, it's a gradual process. Like everything I did was always leading to mental health. So I grew up in the Philippines and I went to a Catholic school. Mm -hmm. So Catholic schools are very big on um, helping out and reaching out to community. I grew up volunteering in orphanages in the local community. So that really helped me. Like I see children struggling with being an orphan and like being able to adjust with having like 
people around you 24-7 as compared as to like when you just used to be at home by yourself. So I really think it's my upbringing. Also, um, it's a thing in the Philippines, but they don't really talk about mental health a lot. Mental health is a big thing. There's a lot of psych majors, but they're kind of in communities. They're not widespread in the whole country. Hmm. It is a big community, but still, it doesn't reach out a lot of areas, especially Catholic schools. Yeah. Because you... Catholic schools kind of believe um, praying can help you through a period of depression or anxiety, which I think is really sad. <laughs> um, okay, so I think, I think that's true. I think you need more than prayer to, to feel better, but prayer helps sometimes. It's a coping mechanism. It's not a solution. Exactly. Um, okay, so right, you say that like um, mental health is only like in certain communities. Why do you think that it doesn't spread throughout the country? Um, I believe it's because people are not really always open to new things. If you have a habit of doing what you know, it's hard to break out of a habit. You need um, different interventions or other people bringing you to different places. I don't think um, mental health is something you'll just like wake up and search online, like what is mental health? It's something that somebody has to introduce to you. And I believe that's why it's such a problem. It's because people don't really talk about it. It's one of the illnesses that is not considered as an illness. So it's not really widespread and talked about. And people don't just like wake up one day and say, I think I need to see a psychologist today. It's more of like a lot of people are referred to psychologists. Like I believe you will do better if you talk to psychologists. So I think that's one more thing. Yeah. Um, I go to therapy and I have been for two years now and I love it. It's been one of the absolute, like number one thing in my life that just allowed me, you know, to deal with my, with my stuff. But I, I totally agree with you because, um, I'm Salvadorian. And so in El Salvador, it's the same thing. You know, some people, if they want, they'll go and seek help, but it's usually like when the case is, you know, already like pretty extreme, Um, where other people not this is it happening and that's usually when they people ask for help yeah and and also like just the way that people see mental illness also you know it's like they see a mental illness is like it has to be like visible or it has to be like super obvious and sometimes it's not you know, like, especially with things like anxiety everyone deals with it differently some people shut down some people get really loud so (laughs) Tell me, um, in the Philippines, have you been able to do any mental health work um, since attending Long Beach in the Philippines? Um, So I moved over here from America when I was 14. Mm -hmm. I wasn't super big on being confident when I was younger. Mm -hmm. I started really earning my confidence at the age of 16 when I transferred off to community college because I learned that if you don't speak out, you'll be left behind. So you need to speak out, do what you need. And that's when I started really um, pursuing mental health. So I didn't really pursue mental health when I was in the Philippines Mm -hmm. since I was young. And um, the schools in the Philippines really... A mold people there that you don't really need to ask for help they give everything to you like you don't move from one classroom to another you sit in one classroom the whole day you don't choose your classes your classes is given to you the first day so I wasn't really big on advocating myself and advocating for the things that I believe in because everything was given out to me mm-hmm. But once I moved to community college, I realized that there are so many things that you can talk about and that you can pursue. And that's really when I started talking about mental health is when I moved to community college. Uh, Do you think like the way that in the Philippines, they, like you said, they choose everything for you. Do you think that, um, do you think that that's okay? Do you think that like that works or, or, or what do you think? I don't think it works just because that once people reach their senior year or their junior year, they have no idea what to do because everything that they've learned so far is the same as this, their peers. So everybody's taking an English class, somebody's, everybody's taking a history class. There really isn't um, a lot of other classes. So there aren't really art classes. 
um, there's no other language class except for like the main language in the country and English. There wasn't any like fashion class, any cooking class. So it was super difficult to like find what you believe on in, in the Philippines. Yeah. Um, I mean, I can understand maybe why, like, especially more conservative, conservative countries, like, you know, the education there tends to be a lot more reserved. Mm -hmm. And it's like to, I think, to preserve um, what they think is like, you know, youth or, or the kids, the children. So I, I get it, but I agree with you. I don't think it works. <laughs> Um, yeah, so, I don't think so, it works. Yeah, so you moved here, um, like you said, to community college first. Um, mm -hmm. How was it transferring out? I mean, for me, I'm a transfer student. It was super difficult. I can't imagine being from a different country. Um, from community college to college, I believe the transition was okay because my professors in nursing has been very really nice and accommodating. Nursing? Um, it's kind of like it's little island in CSU Long Beach. Mm -hmm. There's no building around it. There's constructions and parking lots. So it is really like the small like niche yeah. of people who like believe in the same things. Yeah. And that has been really helpful that I've been surrounded by people who really wants to help the community. And it's been really comforting to be surrounded by like-minded people. Also, um, I transferred off during the time of pandemic. So yeah. I didn't really have like much opportunities to go outside of the nursing school. Yeah. So I believe I'm not fully like transitioned yet since the only part that I transitioned in is the nursing school in Lottery CSU Long Beach. Yeah. Um, where are you currently living right now? Um, I live in Westminster City, so I drive oh, to Cal okay. State Long Beach every time I have a class. Yeah, same. Um, I think that's a lot of people too. You have to drive a little way to get to school. Um, I mean, it's it's. It, I think it's super cool that, um, like I said, you have this focus on mental health because there's so many people that need assistance and a lot like you said won't probably seek it out on their own you know um but I think that that's changing little by little and people are starting to become more aware about mental health now let me ask you um what advice do you have to give to Long Beach students uh, my biggest advice is to always have something else it's really important but aside from studying, that you are doing something else, something to relieve your stress, or just even walking outside, like under the blue skies, can help you calm you down. If you're feeling trapped, like in front of your desk, it's really important to remove yourself out of your desk. So, like, go outside, enjoy the scenery. Um, I have like an Instagram account where I where I just like draw. And I post my drawings over there. And it's been really helpful when I'm really feeling um, sad and like calm. Um, the background at my back, I made it. Like I wow. take a lot of photography and then I edit it a lot. And it's been really calming. So if I feel, I used to do this before a giant nursing exam. I make a picture that's kind of chaotic because my mind feels chaotic full of like all the nursing information. And that's really been helping me to like center myself and find like a common ground I think that's great advice I absolutely agree um and it looks like a great picture I think that's so cool um what's your Instagram account let's let's follow oh, it's really small it's I okay. don't have a lot of followers um it's called the <laughs> underscore LD it's, I can type it out for you okay type it out for me because I want to see how talented you are <laughs> Um, um, I'm very basic. I considered getting a minor in psychology, but nursing classes are so tough that I could not find time to do it. Yeah, I, I, I know. Like, there's no way that um, uh, any career in medicine is easy or fast or, or it ever ends. I feel like every medical professional I've met, you know, like you're studying right now, you're probably going to be studying for the rest of your life. Um, so it's like yeah. a full, it's a full-time <laughs> commitment, like forever, but I think it's cool. I think it's amazing. It's, it's people like you that are, you know, reshaping medicine and reshaping science and hopefully like, you know, more people start to seek out help. You know, I live in LA and there is a huge, huge homeless community here. And a lot of them 
are unfortunately like suffering from some sort of mental illness. And it's gone so far that I think like so many people just don't even know where to go to get help. And they also just are not even in the capacity to seek help, you know? So it's, it's really, it's really, um, it's sad to see, but I think like, you know, what you're doing is amazing. So let's talk a little bit about volunteering because I, you see, like you said, volunteering was a big part of your education back home. Do you think volunteering, um, opened up a door for you in mental health? It definitely opened up a lot of door for me. Um, in community college, I started at 16 and a lot of the people were a lot older than I am. I found like through volunteering that age doesn't really matter. It's what you do to the community. And it really has helped me just like um, what you do every day is what matters at the end. And community service is one of the best things that I really discovered. Um, back in community college, I was a lot, I was in like a volunteering club that always volunteers out in the community. And I met a lot of people that really helped me find what I want and what I'm really passionate about. Um, mental health was something I've always been interested in, but I wasn't always sure if I wanted to pursue it. But like through volunteering in the community and meeting a lot of people, I realized that like everybody has a mental health problem. It might not be serious, it might not be present right now, but it is there. And I think it's a very really important topic that everybody needs to talk about. That's awesome. A hundred percent. Yes, I agree. Um, so with your degree, once you attain it, um, which is, when are you graduating again? Um, I'm graduating at 2023, oh, all okay, spring. Cool. Awesome. So I still have a little bit more over two years. Yeah. I'm a second semester nursing student right now and nursing school is five semesters. Yeah. Um, yeah, I commend you. Um, I took one anatomy class because I had to. <laughs> <laughs> and I was just like oh my god how do people do this <laughs> like every every semester this is crazy I, I learned a lot though I can I remember quite a bit but anyway um okay so volunteering is obviously huge and important for you um do you think it's a good idea for people like who are going through a mental health you know crisis or whatever to, to get into volunteering? Because I, I personally think that I'm going to lean more into volunteering. Um, I feel like it is, but I also believe in putting yourself first. Mm -hmm. So if you think you can help people and that is what you believe is putting yourself first, then yes, I believe you should volunteer. It's really nice. It's really helpful. You learn a lot of people and you can reflect on yourself. But at the same time, if you really have a mental health crisis, I would rather you take the time for yourself. If you have the extra time, um, I would rather have you like dwell on like what you believe on, get the help that you need. Um, I know CSU Long Beach has a really good program called um, CAPS. I haven't visited them, but I've read their website and they are talking about very really good um, interventions that is really helpful for the students. That's awesome. Would you ever be interested in um, working with students at Long Beach? I would, but my schedule has been really hectic, especially since nursing school has been going, um, it, it changes every single time. The hospitals, you don't know when the hospital is going to let you in or when the hospital will not let you in. So yeah. my schedule changes so much that I can't commit to anything that has a set schedule. Like my clinical schedule was supposed to have um, a pre-planning day the be day before, but it got canceled. So now my clinicals is technically on Friday and Saturday instead of what's written down as Thursday and Friday. Right. So, so I you're... would like to mentor people to mental health if it doesn't have a set schedule, but I looked online and you need um, like at least 20 hours as a mental health mentor and my schedule doesn't allow it. Well, you know, maybe right now, but in the future, you could always come back and, um, and help students because I think that that'd be really cool. Um, Definitely. Yeah. So any more advice that you have as a mental health advocate 
for Long Beach students? Um, I really believe in putting yourself before you help other people. I know it kind of sounds rude and mean, but it's not supposed to be. It's really something that you should care about yourself. Know what's safe for you and before helping other people. I also always tell people when I have like friends struggling with mental health that being alone is never the answer. If you would like to cry, get the phone, call your friend, call someone, call a psychologist. I believe there's a emergency number that the school provides for mental health. You can call that, call anyone at all. You might even just call like a random phone number, but crying alone is really never the answer. You need um, somebody there beside you. Yeah, and thank you for mentioning that crisis text line. Um, I'll, I'll be mentioning that as well um, during our episode because um, it's new. And, you know, like you mentioned, um, I never really thought because, you know, we're so trained to hide our pain. Like, I never thought of how sometimes in that moment, you just want to like vent. And so one of the big reasons with this, uh, you know, text line that we have at Long Beach, some students just are able to like text this line and oh, then, oh, that's nice. And then just, you know, vent like, I'm really blah, 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 blah. And, you know, just kind of get it all out. And like you said, when you, I feel like just when you say it to someone else, you get a clearer opinion of what's going on, you know, because in your own mind, you know, it tends to be bigger sometimes than really what in reality it might be. Um, so I think that's, that's very true. Definitely talk to someone, reach someone, mm -hmm. call someone. Um, and, and I think like establishing maybe like the support system around you as a student also is really important um, because we deal with a lot, you know, a lot of changes. And like you mentioned, you know, your schedule changes like all the time. And for someone who has like anxiety, you know, that can throw you off. It can throw you off into like a spiral. So I totally agree. Um, Thank you, Elaine, for your advice. Your story is so inspirational. And like I said, um, <laughs> yeah, I, I'm going to share your article, uh, that the ones that someone published before, um, with my family, because I think it's super cool to see like just how, um, not just because you're an immigrant, but also because being from another country that doesn't have mental health advocacy as much, you know, like, it, it is important to, to have these conversations. Um, one more question though. Do you have family back in the Philippines? I do, I have a lot of family back in the Philippines. Um, I am still in contact with my friends in the Philippines. One of the biggest thing that um, we, I'm worried about the Philippines is they have two things that's not legal. They don't have same sex marriage and divorce isn't legal. Oh, wow. Yeah, so that's something that I think greatly impacts mental health, that if divorce isn't legal, then there are so many people that are trapped in the relationships that can be really dangerous for them. And that's something I'm really um, scared for. Yeah, yeah. And also because same sex is I illegal also, right? Like there's so much LGBTQ people that like, just suffer a, an enormous amount of extra weight of like pressure, stress, and all of that. And um, I agree. I think it's like, it would be nice if we could just, you know, make things change with the snap of a finger. But I don't know. What do you think? What do you think the Philippines can do other than obviously making that stuff? Um, uh, I don't think the legal stuff will be happening for a while looking at like the climate the political climate right now mm -hmm. since they're still very conservative and it is a like 90 percent catholic country yeah so they are not really too open about divorce i believe there's just two countries that's not open to divorce the philippines and the vatican really that's so interesting um if it's not two it's three countries i can't remember yeah, it's it's I guess just that you know whole like conservative way of thinking, but it's so just right doesn't... now I think what's needed is mental health advocates, like you mentioned, 
mm-hmm. people need to reach out to these people because they are vulnerable and they need people helping them during this time. So I believe that mental health should be bigger in the Philippines during this time since legal actions can't be done right now. Yeah, absolutely. Um, If, you know, once you get your degree and everything, would you ever consider like, going back and establishing a practice in the Philippines? Right now, I would really like to receive a PhD in nursing. And before you can receive a PhD in nursing, um, you need a couple of years working as a nurse before you can do that. So I don't think it's going to be anytime soon, but I know for sure that I'll be going back there any chance that I can. That's awesome. Yeah, and, and even like, even though you you know, you won't have your PhD like overnight just yet. It's going to be a few years, like through, through your example and just what you do, you teach people, you know, people see, and then they, they kind of learn also because especially being a psychology, uh, you know, having that psychology interest, like people are always going to know, oh, Elaine really likes mental health. So let's ask Elaine, (laughs) you know, (laughs) that's awesome. Um, Thank you so much. For, for helping me out with uh, with this interview. It was really, really cool to meet you. And um, again, like seriously, congratulations on Thank you. just an amazing resume, girl. Keep going, go, go, <laughs> go. Cause we need like medical professionals like yourself. I admire like psychology so much cause you know, I've, I've benefited greatly from therapy and stuff like that. What did you major in? My major is journalism. Oh, you need anatomy for journalism? No. So it's like, you know, like when, uh, I don't know how exactly your, your schedule was in community college, but like to transfer out, you need to do like certain requirements. And one of them, I needed lab science. So I thought, oh, anatomy sounds like fun. It was fun, you know, when it was done, but like... (laughs) it's just so many words so many names and it's like I respect it I respect it so much so much um so thank you Elaine for your time today um uh our episode will air Monday and basically from now on I'll be editing this interview um so that it's ready for for the episode and we'll just plug it in with um everything else that we'll be recording that night um but that's pretty much it for now um I have your email thankfully so yes. <laughs> if, reach out if you have any questions or if you I, want to schedule another zoom if you need more materials yes please thank you so much I appreciate that Elaine thank you um and we'll be talking soon and um hopefully we get to we get to hear you on that episode I'm excited <laughs> yeah all right Elaine, I would thank- love to be like part of the episode next time I know you asked about Friday but Friday is really um difficult for me because it's my clinical day yeah you know um we're we're sort of like I'm still new to the podcast so I don't really know how they did things before but apparently we're gonna be doing like a whole new set and we're introducing a lot of um new segments so I kind of want to have a professional on mental health, um, drop in and, you know, just give advice every once in a while. So I might need you for that. Um, oh, and, and you know, great. please contact me. I'll yeah, try my best to be there. Because it's, it's good because you're a student currently at Long Beach and soon eventually you will graduate. And so there's a lot of like, you know, good things to, to talk about there. Um, it's relatable. It's timely students can relate to it. And that's really what we want is for students to see themselves in the stuff that, that we talk about. So um, yes, I will definitely contact you if we need you for another episode. Thank you yeah, so much, sure. Elaine. Yeah, you're amazing. Thank you. Thank you so much. You're amazing too. <laughs> Thanks. Keep up the good work. Oh, thank you too. Yeah, because journalism is about reaching out to the people that needs to be reached out. And I believe you're doing that because you are looking for a lot of platforms for mental health to be heard yeah and I I love journalism because um like you said it's literally that it's speaking for it's speaking for people who don't usually speak up or who wouldn't usually have the ability to tell their story and that's what I like you know I like digging and asking and getting to know someone 
just, uh, you know, aside from reading an article online, which the articles they've written about you are great and super informative, but you know, it's different than actually sitting down, getting to know you, spending time with you. And that's what journalism needs, you know, to get a good story. So, but um, thank you, Elaine. And hopefully we get to talk soon. Yeah, for sure. Alrighty, have a great rest of your day. Bye.